we're live and welcome to the Sunday session. My name's Steve Judge. I'm your host for Football Network World's weekly discussion with football practitioners from around the world. This morning I'm joined by three top practitioners to discuss talent ID, strategies to overcome player maturation and relative age bias. Um, before I uh, introduce you to the, the three guys, I'll just uh, share my screen with you give you an overview of today's format. So as usual, we'll look for you guys to uh, feed in your questions to, to Rick, Andreas and Bob um, to help you do that to keep the flow of the conversation going. You can see we've kind of split the session into two halves. So in the first half of today's session. Uh, the guys will each give a, a presentation around their key topics. And that'll lead then into a sort of first discussion around the impact of maturation and relative age um, in terms of player selection and, and, and development. And in the second half, if you want to direct your questions more on the topics of how we're looking at measuring potential against just viewing the performance that we're seeing in front of us so we're not just picking the, the the biggest and strongest players on the pitch but we're looking at who is going to be the best players in the future and then to help enable that you know the different development pathways that we can have so then we're sort of looking at areas like bio banding um so that we can get deeper into those discussions let me uh, start to introduce you to the three guys so first of all i'd like to Welcome, Rick Riedveld, as first team sports scientist from AZ Alkmaar. Yeah, Rick, how are you today? Very good. Thanks, Steve. Uh, nice to be here and uh, hope it will be an interesting uh, afternoon. Yes, yeah, without a doubt. Um, just to sort of introduce you a little bit deeper, I'm just going to be just share with us a bit of your, your football background and your pathway that's led you to AZ Alkmaar. Yeah, so I did. Um, uh, the human movement science at the uh, University of Amsterdam. And then I started working as, a, as an intern at, uh, at AZ Alkmaar, the youth academy. Uh, I did my research over there. And uh, after my research, uh, I, I started working as a, a, um, a strength and conditioning coach. Um, uh, I started working with the data, with the biological age, the physical testing. Uh, I did it for two years at the youth, and after that, I went to the first team. I worked as a as a data scientist, sports scientist. Uh, so uh, yeah, I worked a lot with the youngsters uh, from under eleven to the, the second team. Uh, Specialty is, uh, I think, the biological age, the physical testing, and how to uh, make it practical for for trainers and uh, and. Um, and coaches and the scouting. Okay, Rick. Yeah, thanks, Rob. We'll be sort of learning a lot more about your your work at AZ uh, in a moment. But uh, first, then I'll move yeah. over to our our second panelist for today. Um, a late deadline signing from Stuttgart, Andreas Schumacher. Andreas, how are you today? Fine, fine. Thanks for having me. Um, Steve, hi, hi to all the guys li listening to today. My name is Andreas. I'm 39 years old, happily married. Have a one um, one son who's 14 months old. Was a former third league player, and I've been coaching for over a decade. Different age groups, different levels. At Stuttgart in Hamburg. I was assistant coach of the Bundesliga team in the season two, 2017. Did all my licenses and parallel during the same time and studied uh, sports scientists to the master degrees. And I'm now head of the performance phase and head of the individualization at Stuttgart. Nice to take part this afternoon. Looking forward to have a good uh, conversation and discussion with you all. Fantastic. It's good to have you with us, Andres. Um, finally, we have uh, Bob Browis from the Belgium FA. Bob, how are you today? Fine, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. 
And uh, thank you very much, Steve, for this nice invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here and to share a um, little bit uh, my ideas with, with uh, everybody. And of course, also to listen to my colleagues, to Rick and Andreas, and um, yeah, to see what uh, the questions will be. It's always uh, for me about sharing information. And um, from each session, I'm also learning a lot. So I'm very pleased to, uh, to be with you here uh, all together. Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, Bob, yes, just wondered if you could yeah, just quickly share a little bit of your, your background and, and uh, your role within the Belgium FA. Yeah, I'm working for the Belgian FA since 1999. Um, I'm Master of Physical Education Studio at the University of Ghent. And um, since 1999, I'm involved in uh, coach education uh, school as a coordinator. Then I became the director of the Belgian uh, coach education uh, school. Now I'm technical director of the Flemish Association, the, the Flemish part of the Belgian FA, and also um, senior manager of youth development. It means that I'm responsible for the coordination of the national youth teams under 15, under 17, and also the, the future uh, projects. Uh, and I'm also a national youth coach under 17, working two years with the same players, starting from under 16 until the European Championship. And then uh, we restart uh, again. Okay, brilliant, brilliant. Okay, so to get us moving, um, I think we'll toss of the coin and uh, we'll sort of uh, see that Rick probably lost the toss and uh, we'll, we'll be putting you in, in first. So uh, <laughs> sort of welcome back, Rick. I'll uh, hand the screen over to you and sort of give your, your presentation on uh, how as uh, head of sports science, you're introducing this topic of player maturation to the scouts and coaches at AZ Alkmaar. Thanks, Steve. I wouldn't say I lost the task. Maybe you can say I win the task. <laughs> I, will, I will kick off with my uh, presentation uh, about the AZ Alkmaar and how we do it. Uh, I will use actually biological age and, uh, and our physical testing in the uh, in the way of communicating and creating a culture of uh, uh, in a, at Days at Alkmaar where everybody speaks the same language. And uh, I think that's one of the, yeah, the, the key factors which helped our academy to uh, develop such good players. So, uh, yeah, thank you guys all for, for joining this uh, session. Um, so at Days at Alkmaar, we, uh, we do a lot of testing. Uh, and we're starting at, uh, yeah, uh, when the players come in at our under 11, uh, and we use uh, biological age to say something about uh, about the maturation status of the players, and we combine this with this physical, physical testing. Uh, we test uh, about speed, agility, footwork, explosiveness, like uh, probably every other club. But the key thing we do is we combine these two, and in this way we can say something about, yeah, which player has the most physical potential. Uh, so these are two, three guys from the, on the 14, now on the 15. And I'm the guy who has to say something about which guy has the most physical potential. So I'm gonna talk you through. Uh, we use biological age, um, but what is actually biological age? Uh, if you look at these three guys, they're all around age 14. Uh, the middle guy is the oldest one, the right guy is the youngest one, but there's not a big difference. Maybe, uh, yeah, it's, it's a half year difference. Uh, but if you take a look at the biological age, we're using the Mirwald uh, formula. And the Mirwald formula is based on, uh, uh, on uh, an average, uh, yeah, normal guy gets his growth spurt around his age 14. So the middle guy is the average guy. You get his growth spurt around the age 14. The left guy, the tall guy, is the, the early mature and the right guy is the late mature. And to calculate the biological age, we say, okay, the, the normal guy on age 14 is, is normal. So he's got like zero, uh, uh, his, his biological age is the same as his normal age. The left guy, the tall guy, he's got his growth spurt around 12.4. So he's 1.6 years ahead. So we uh, add his number to his age. And the small guy, 
is a leader, so we get his growth spurt around 14.8, uh, so we 0.8 behind. So that's how we're using the biological age, and we're getting the those numbers. And if you then take a close look at the difference within a team, there's a 2.7 years difference. So it's really unfair to uh, do a sprint test with these with these three guys and say, okay, this guy is the fastest. It's probably the left guy, the right guy is the slowest. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's 2.7 years difference in maturation, so in physical development. So how can we give a fair judgment uh, on the physical performance of these players? Uh, let's, for example, we take a 30 meter sprint and we get the scores of the guys. It's the, like I told you, the left guy is the fastest in this example and the right guy is the slowest. Um, but what does this actually say? So if we do this test and we give the scores back to the, the trainer, uh, the left guy will be the fastest guy. So in potential, if you say you will be the fastest, but this is really true. So what we do at AZ Alkmaar is we, um, we do, we're doing the testing for 10 years now. And we put it in our database and we could create percentiles. So for every biological, biological age, you can see on the x-axis, uh, we have a certain scores. And from that scores, we create the percentiles. So the red line is the worst uh, score for that bio age. And the green line on the bottom is the fastest score on that age. So we compare those guys with their biological peers. So if we then put the scores in, uh, the score of the, the tall guy, the 15.5 on bio age, it will be on the yellow line, like average. So we say he scores a five. So this is how we communicate to the, to the coaches and also to the scouting. So his score if on a 30 meter sprint is a five. So that means that 50% is slower and 50% is faster. Take a look at the 14 year old guy. He will score around an eight. And the 12.7 on bio age with his 4.4 seconds is actually the fastest if you look at uh, the potential. So what we expect of these three guys is that they follow their line in, uh, in the development or even they become faster. So this is uh, how we talk to trainers and, um, and scouting about uh, physical potential. So that's how we talk about speed and that's how we talk about footwork. And we're giving them uh, yeah, a, a sheet score, explosiveness, uh, speed, footwork, agility. And we only communicate in these numbers. So this is the raw, the raw scores of all the testing. But these numbers are where, uh, where the, yeah, the communication within the whole club. So every trainer knows about these scores and talks in these scores. So it's really easy to, to give someone a score from zero to 10 and have a discussion about it and say something about his physical potential. So what about the development of players? It's also the way how we uh, make development uh, visible. Uh, this is the, the counter movement jump of one of, uh, of our captain, the guy uh, you see in the left picture. And the, the really nice thing in this picture is his development. So when this guy came in, he scored like the lowest uh, on this counter movement jump. Uh, so what you expect uh, he's gonna do is he's also gonna end up like the lowest, but it's, it's actually, it's not true because uh, we believe in development and this guy was training his ass off the whole time. And yeah, he's the example of uh, that you can, you, can, you can develop yourself in a certain way that you can end up in the top. So, but with training, with a good program, there's a lot. Uh, there's a lot possible. So when we do the scouting on a young age, 
we are not focusing on these low scores uh, because we can we believe we can develop these kids. But if a kid come in with a good uh, with good scores, then we say, okay, this guy is going to end up with high scores. So to summarize it all, we have the combination of the biological ways and the physical testing to have a fair judgment about our players. Uh, this will create an easy way of communicating within the club. And on a low age, we focus on the, the good scores and not on the, on the bad scores because we believe the players can develop. And that's it. Thank you. Brilliant. No, absolutely love that, Rick. Thank you very much. No problem, Steve. To, uh, to uh, jump into, um, but before we do that, let me sort of, uh, sort of uh, get your sort of pass over the baton to Andreas Schumacher. So, Andreas, uh, the floor is yours. So oh, hi guys again. Thank you, Rick. Very interesting insight in your work at Acid Agma. Um, I would like to start with that first slide I just prepared for you. Is when when we do start by scouting under 10 years old or under 11 years old, we already know that there is a school talent pool in football because on the left hand side you see maybe all the young football players by the age of seven so and looking back or, or looking three years later all the young football players by the age of 10 they might be the fastest the strongest the tallest and the most powerful ones or maybe the the most skillful ones and they're all, that that's the left over so all the other kids they're already dropped out, going to different sports, or were benched by the village club teams. So, and by knowing that, we have an already school talent pool in football um, in our area. Um, we could think about turning everything down and preparing the younger kids by the age of six, seven, eight, nine to make them better movers, better ball handlers, everything else, but we don't have the money put in to, 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 um, to do that. So therefore we look at a nice um, side or, or the good effect is following. If you see that, it's just an easy slide to, to get to know the biological age and by watching this slide before, if we know on the right side we have only these players over, it's a natural, um, we say, identification because of the youngest, they are born in the fourth quarter and maybe late matured as Rick um, uh, sh showed up earlier, is if they are over, we know these are already the good guys and the best ones, the talented ones of the fourth quarter and maybe late matured, because they're still playing soccer on a, diff, on, a uh, on a specific level. So every, everybody's talking about that the, uh, the relative age effect is worse. And yes, that's true because we are losing a lot of good players with high potential. But on the other hand side, we know that the late matured and late born um, that's a natural uh, identification, but that's the, the, left, the best they're left over. And we do have a problem in the older ones. And as Rick showed with the, with the oldest um, kid or with the, with the biggest kid, he might be average, but still good enough. So we have a lot of kids that are born in the first quarter and the second quarter that might be early matured or average normal matured. And they are they still in in the program and still in soccer or in football, um, but they're only average. So what we then try is how to see potential for our scouts is um, 
we for sure, what we can see is a chronological age, the birthday. Um, is he born late or early in the year? Then there are some signs, even without measuring, um, about the biological maturity. Um, is, is there a lot of muscles on that little kid? Um, is he grown up high? And so then um, if there's potential that might be late, if it's only performance, if you look at performance, it might be early. So you give it a different mark for that kid. Then we try to find out the football age. So there's a lot of potential if the football age is young. What I do mean is if that kid is 10 or 11 years old, but just playing two or three years in soccer, he has a young football age compared to the other one. They might be an old football age. They started by the age of five or his parent. His dad was a soccer coach early and he's just playing since six years. So that would be a marker for, yes, it's more performance, less potential, maybe. And we, we try to find out the amount of training. Um, and then I mean the specific training of soccer. Has he maybe twice a week training sessions with a quality of training in his uh, village club with um, less talented or less good players. Uh, that would be an indicator for there's more potential to grow. And on the other hand side, if the training amount is already high because he comes from, a, from another performance, youth performance center with three or four times training and a good, good coach and a good, good training group, that would be a good quality of training that speaks for he's more on the performance side and it's natural that he performs better than this guy but the potential on this guy might be um, higher and the same one is about the specification so if that guy has only been trained in soccer and is kind of like a spe specialist in soccer already by the age of 9 10 11 or 12 the performance might be high but the potential might be low and the other way around about the diversification of the, um, the sports. If a kid has done not only soccer, maybe he uh, is, is doing um, fighting or gymnastics or dancing or whatever he's doing or playing basketball or skiing. Um, and he has a high score on that. That might be a indicator for, for a higher potential than the other way around. And what we then try is when we are having them with us, not only creating a little games where they're equal numbered and um, where the, the stronger kids um, are just showing off more, we do little overload games like 2 we ones on the one side, 3 v 2s on the other side, and playing 5v5, 7v7 um, on a wider pitch where even this guy um, can show his skills, can show his game intelligence, can show his decision making, making, and that's very subjective, but it's on, a, on my, in my opinion, it's better um, to see when to dribble, when to pass. Um, on the other hand, th these guys tend to make it by themselves, to, just to show up because they're faster but I don't see is the pass the better option or is the dribbling the better option. They always choose the dribbling because it's no problem to, for them to pass it. And then now, now that you guys know how we see the potential of the performance side, we, I just brought you a little slide where yeah, for sure a guy who's performing well in an early age and has potential, that's a one in a million guy uh, we are looking for. But we might have this guy where all the clubs are going to, the go-to guys. And, and but we have this little section, I, I just call them the raw diamonds because the performance might be not that high in this moment, but the potential is up high. So maybe um, not every scout has, has, this, has these guys on the, on the map. Uh, so if you find someone of these, that's quite interesting. And I call them the change of perspective. And that uh, Rick showed this very nicely is if you have this little guy and, and he shows some good skills, technique wise, game intelligence wise, this decision making wise, 
uh, fighting wise um, you, you just have to try to put them in a different perspective because um, does he play on the on the right game on the right pitch size could could he be more effective if he would play with the younger teams and that that is hard to compare but here might be you you might have players by the age 9 10 11 12 they still can make it during a good development program yeah on the other hand we have here these guys might won't won't make it at the end these guys maybe as well and then you here have a, a screaming performer who every scout sees and have on his map and bring it but if there's no potential I'd rather go for a raw diamond before I, I just have too many screaming performs. So, and if, if we have them here, and then uh, it's maybe close to that, what, what Rick, is, Rick is doing. Um, we do measure it at Stuttgart. If, if we have he, the kids here, we have three different types of measurement because we still don't know which is the best one and gives us the, 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 the exact outcome. So we try to have three different measurings that a decrease um, that we are wrong, but we still could be wrong. So after that, we have the P1, P2, P3 guys, like Rick showed, the early matured, the normal matured, and the late matured. And we are mixing age groups. They do get a different training. Um, we give this a coach to change their mindset. Therefore, we have rolling uh, qualifying dates to put that normal guy, the normal uh, matured guy in a group with same age and see is he still the best one. Then we put him in a group where he is biological age, the youngest, to see if he can still compete. Then we we put him in a group where he's might be in the one of the oldest, if he has some leadership skills and um, is taken responsibility so and still we don't know if this gives us just more knowledge uh, that we can talk about but we think we we can put the players then in their comfort zones and we easily can put them out of their comfort zones and just give them different roles during sessions or during games yeah, that's a short overview to the very interesting topic. I'm looking forward to what Bob will show us after. And yeah, hope you throw some questions at us. Okay, fantastic. Thanks for that, Andreas. I think there's a like, nice foundation there for the uh, performance versus potential uh, model that uh, we're no doubt are going to get deeply into. Uh, following uh, this presentation from Bob Browis. So Bob, I'll hand the screen over to you. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Steve. So um, nice presentation, Rick and Andreas. Um, so I think what, what you um, explained was really true. And um, I start with the question, what's now the real problem in, um, in youth football? And uh, we uh, spoke about maturation, about relative age effect. It's really not the same as sometimes people um, they confuse this. But um, yeah, both I call as uh, talent contaminators. They can increase um, yeah the unfair situation, the unequal battle, and and this is true. This is a problem. Yeah, this is a problem um, when you see their late mature player um, two years. Um, biologically younger than um, than other players. When he is also born at the end of the year, you see a real problem when they have to play a football game. But for me, there is more. This is a problem, but the real problem is what you also said, Andreas, the mindset of the coaches. And for me also, the mindset of the directors of the youth academies. They um, often um, think that it's about winning um, youth games today and then they try to identify uh, identify the high performers and they focus really on team creation um, so this is for me not uh, the right way i think it's better and and for me the the point to um, to look forward and uh, yeah to identify the high potentials 
um, in order to win later football games in the future. This means that we need to focus on individual development and not on um, the team creation. So this is um, for me a completely different approach. And for me, this is the real problem in, uh, in youth football. So I think we, we really have to focus on uh, late developers in youth football. The most important is a player. We are working with the player. And um, I think the, the reason we have to focus on late developers is because we, we must give them the same chances to uh, the other players. Um, it's a principle of equality. And I refer here to um, a fantastic declaration on uh, ethics in youth sports. And it says that late developers will be offered similar chances to practice sports and be given the same professional attention available to early developers. And I think this is the first point. We need to focus on late developers because it's a, it's a question of equality. For a federation, it's also important. And we, like Belgium, we are an, uh, a small country in the world. We cannot uh, lose one talented player. And uh, so it means that when we focus only on um, yeah, high performers, when they are 14, 15, 16 years old, it's not good. So um, I will start off, show you here a video of Dries Mertens, who was the inspirator of our future project that we started um, 12 years ago. So Dries is um, 18 years old. When you see his face, you think that maybe he's 15, 16 years. He was sent away um, by uh, Anderlecht by Ghent. And here he is playing in the first team of uh, a third division club, Alst in, uh, in Belgium. But uh, you see immediately that um, he's very skillful. His body and ball control is excellent. Decision making is excellent. He yeah, has even uh, speed, um, explosivity. And um, OK, this is uh, for us very important to um, to find this when you are looking talent identification. When you see the career of Dries Mertens, um, you see that um, in uh, 2004, he had four selections with the under 70 team. I was then coach, and I saw Dries as a very, very talented player, but um, we prepared also our uh, European Championship, and it was impossible to, um, to play with Dries, because with Dries it was impossible, yeah, to, uh, or for Dries it was impossible to perform, and, even to win games. And watch, he must wait until 24, when he was 24 years old, to play for the first time for the Belgian A team. So um, this means we had to think about to change a little bit our system of youth development also. And we started then in 2008 with a future project with our national youth teams. Um, we doubled the, the teams. Instead of having under 15, only under 15, under 16, under 17, we also started with future uh, teams under 15, under 16, under 17. It means uh, teams with only um, late mature players. And we started in 2008. You see there Yannick uh, Ferreira Carrasco, who is now playing for, um, for, for Atletico Madrid. He had also played a lot of uh, times for the Belgian uh, national team. I think he will start also tonight against England. And he was a um, player born in 93. So what was very important now in our future project, um, that we offer the same values and uh, the same tactical principles as we do with our uh, normal under 15, under 16, under 17 teams. And uh, we are working with these guys, with these uh, late developers, with the same technical stuff. But my assistant coach, he is here uh, the head coach of the future team. But I also follow, um, of course, the, these guys. And they are very talentful. But what's for us very important is we prepare them also for uh, future national A teams. We gave the, the same program. Uh, there are selection trainings. There are training camps. There are international games. There are participating tournaments. Like, for instance, we have a fantastic formation uh, tournament with the 16. You see there a player also, Maxime de Perper, in uh, April 2016. He was there playing against Czech Republic. Uh, watch his baby face. You think he is maybe under 13 or under 14. And in um, February this year, he made his debut against Manchester United. So this is our uh, future project that we have. And uh, two years ago, we started also with a big goal project. The big goal project is um, 
a little bit the same. It's also a, a project with late mature players, but from um, each uh, age group, we, uh, we take the 10 um, biggest potential talents and we are making together an under 16, under 17 big goal team and an under 18, under 19 uh, big goal team. This is a project uh, we're supported by the Belgian Olympic and the Federal Committee. They give us uh, financial support. We can invest more in the staff. We can uh, give them additional program. And this is um, also for uh, Belgium sports, an uh, innovative project. And um, the, the, the Olympic Committee sees this project as a good practice for other sports, but also biological maturation has an import. So what are the targets here of this uh, project? We call this Big Old, because Big Old, we want to prepare them also for the Olympic team under 21. And it's really an individual development program that we give. We do an individual follow-up. We have a coordinator. We visit the club. We are speaking with the coaches. Um, so we ask also the clubs uh, to give this players, this talentful players, a minimum playing time of 50%. Because when the youth coach um, of an elite uh, club in Belgium, he wants to win a game, he will not play with this player. So it's important also to offer this players enough playing time. And uh, for us, it's very important, of course, that uh, we really look for uh, late mature players. So 90% of the, the squads must absolutely be late mature players. And there must also be continuity in uh, the selection. It means at the end of the season, 80% of the players are uh, still the same. So what we are doing uh, during this uh, project, we also we are also working with um, uh, mental coaches. We do also some tests. And for us, uh, the, the five uh, important criteria of talent uh, identification is learning ability and self-development, winning mindset, explosiveness, body and ball control inside in the game. So uh, we are doing some tests. We are working with the players. We give them uh, some uh, feedback about uh, this five um, competences. Here is a, a game that we played uh, this year against Luxembourg, and you will immediately see uh, how skillful the players, uh, the late mature players are. So watch here how they are building up one touch, two touch, um, really skillful, um, very, very good um, decision making. And we are playing against yeah early mature players, and you will see here the one v one you will. And okay, there stop the yeah the attack. So this is for us very important to work with uh, this kind of players. So we started in 2008. Uh, we try to uh, improve our future project. Now we have also our big goal players. So what is uh, the effectiveness uh, until today? We are very happy uh, when we see, for instance, our um, under 21 team now and this is the age group. Okay, they are um, even powerful as, uh, as other players. We, see, we, we saw four players, four future team players um, in uh, the under 21 who beat Wales uh, this week with, uh, with 5 0. But there are still two uh, other players who are even uh, with the 18 now. So, like Yari Viscaren, he made his debut against Scotland um, in 2019, one year ago. And he uh, was an under-16 future player in the season 2016-2017. And uh, also Alex Salomakers this week, uh, Thursday, he started for the first time against Ivory Coast. So these are still players born in 2001 and uh, born in 1999 who still can play with uh, the under-21. So we are Belgium, we are a small country. We hope um, to prepare well our future. And this means for us very important uh, to work with late uh, developers um, in our um, national teams uh, pathway until the 18. So this was a little bit um, the story of Belgium future uh, project. So I'm um, ha happy that I could present this to you, and I'm uh, curious if you are uh, if you have some uh, question about this project. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that, Bob. Um, I think we have we'll certainly delve deeper into into that project. Probably uh, certainly at the development side of things, but um probably sort of go rewind back to the beginning again and sort of look um more in general at the the impact that that 
the kind of relative age and and uh, player maturation has in those younger age groups when it comes to to player selection. Um, I don't know with, with Rick first with the um, with the testing. You said you were just using you're only using the Merwell test when it comes to, to to testing the the biological age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're using the Merwell equation for the biological age. Uh, yeah, we're doing that in a. Uh, yeah, for over more than 10 years now. Uh, for us, it works. I know in England, they use the Gammas Rush. And uh, I don't know, how, how is it in Belgium and, uh, and Germany, guys? Yeah, in Belgium, we do the, the same. We also use both tests. Yeah. Um, but we are, we think also that, um, yeah, you, you can see, you can see if a player is late mature. You, you yeah. see, for instance, the baby face. You see that, um, yeah, the... The muscles are not there eh, when you uh, serve the legs. Uh, first, they are growing in, in length. And mm -hmm. then, and, um, okay, they start a little bit uh, making some muscles. So, so we try to combine this combine this together with uh, our medical staff um, because there is no 100% uh, correct uh, valuable test also. Yeah. Um, what's for me important is to give the same opportunity to this late developers as to the, the early module players. And it's not, not hundred, it's not really 100% about, we cannot uh, make a mistake in the testing. It's about mm -hmm. working well with uh, this kind of players. Yeah, that's, I think that's, that's the same way we're working, uh, we're working, Bob. So we're using the mirror world as a, as a first, yeah. Uh, uh, first, uh, how do you say it? First test. And then we also use our eyes. How, how is this guy moving in the gym? Uh, the mirror will say he's an early mature, but if you look at him, he's not an early mature. So, so the mirror world is a is a first assessment, and after that, we do our own assessment to make a fair judgment. So we combine those two, and and that's how we say something about biological age. With uh, Andreas, I think you mentioned you were using three tests at Stuttgart, because I know there's there's been a fair amount of research around the mirror world test and the standard variation around that, which particularly with earlier and late maturers that is yeah, we, on we its own is probably not a is not a great also, estimator of age it's a, we also use the two mentioned and yeah we we ask the the body height of the parents and new is we do a um, ultrasound of the bones in the hand yeah. And from that, I mean, are you all then using the same kind of methods of, I think everyone is taking an average of what, around 13.9 years for the, for the median age for a, an average mature? Mm -hmm. yeah. How is it in, uh, in, in Belgium, Bob? Do uh, all the clubs use the same way of uh, measuring? Uh, no, no, not at all. So this is the system um, of the national youth teams, what I explained. Uh, but mm -hmm. there are clubs who are really investing also in, uh, in this and um, yeah I, I think um, it's important to measure of course but I repeat mm -hmm. it's, it's more important to work with uh, with the late developers and uh, we still see uh, also a big problem um, on relative age effect and when you are speaking about the youngest age group under mm -hmm. 11 and under 12 you are you are only starting under 12 or under 13 and you you said yeah yeah so i think in belgium we have to think about this also is this not too early to put uh yeah players eight nine ten years old in an elite youth academy because players who are born in january they are one year older than players born in december so it's mm -hmm. that they are also um, more skillful because they have more hours of practice yeah so uh, these are still, for me, uh, some challenges in Belgium, yeah. Yeah, I think that's what Andreas also was saying about uh, yeah, the guy who doesn't have a, a, a high football skill and doesn't have a lot of training hours, but he still got, got a lot of potential. And also you mentioned about, uh, about winning in, in the youth with the youth teams. It's, it's not important in the end. It's about... Uh, uh, getting the players to the first team, and then uh, and and then it's about winning. So about the uh, the playing time, uh, I think the playing time for all the players from under eleven till uh, up to under sixteen should be equal. 
Yeah. So all the players should play the same amount of uh, minutes minutes in games because you don't know yet who's got the most potential. You you can make an estimation, uh, but if uh, if some players don't play any matches, yeah, they won't develop in the end. Yeah. So Rick, when you're when you're doing those tests, those evaluating, I mean, what is the youngest age you're able to start putting players into P1, P2, P3, early mature, average mature? Yeah, we try to how, make. A- how accurate are the tests so that you can make those clear judgments? Are you able to do it with eleven-year-olds that obviously yeah, it's, mature it's, as a young and the rest you're just guessing and. Yeah, it's difficult to do it with 11 years old because they're uh, the it, it shifts a lot, so it's uh, it's difficult. But we, we still do it to say something about the the physical testing. We look at the guys, and uh, at a, at an 11 year old, you can see if someone is an early mature or late mature. Uh, so that's that's how we do it, and it it becomes more accurate when uh, when they're coming uh, more to the to the age of 14. So uh, yeah, we still make an, uh, make an estimation of, of the biological age when they're coming in. So in terms of how you change their physical development post 14, 15, 16, it's, it gets a lot more accurate, but in yeah. terms of, of understanding yeah, who you're bringing into the building, predicting whether they're an early mm-hmm. or a late mature, it's, it's, not an exact science as such. No, yeah, there's, there's what you mentioned. There, there's an error in the in the mirror world, and uh, it becomes bigger on, on younger age. So uh, yeah, it's 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 about uh, using the mirror world and giving your own interpretation of it, and looking at the guys, looking at the parents, uh, uh, and then uh, say something about the uh, the maturation of the players and uh, and doing the physical testing and. And giving back the the feedback to scouting and uh, and trainers. Hey Andres, with your your scouts when they're looking at 11, 12, 13 year olds before it probably becomes a lot more obvious to identify who are the early and late maturers. I mean, what are what is the information that you're passing on to the scouts in terms of the things that they should be looking at for that are cues for. Now, who are who are likely you know he's performing better than everyone else because biologically he's older than everyone else or or vice versa he's going to be a late maturer so you know you have to sort of measure his performance in a, in a different way it's, still, uh, it's hard to say because we are just starting by working like that and we've just thrown this to the scouts uh, so I can't really say what I can say is I'm um, speaking about to the coaches that are here. If we have uh, players with us, they are likely to join the club and we have trials. Um, then the trainers and or the coaches and me, we are talking about these, these kind of things. But there are no experiences that we can say the last 10 years we did that to, to actually say, we're on a good path, so we now started implementing this. Okay, and Bob, I think you sort of touched on you know, there was a few obvious traits that you you can see with the with the eye test. Um, I mean, what would you say would be the key ones when you're looking at that that younger younger age group? Um, well, but what, what do you mean with the eye test? So you, so obviously we, we can test players' biological age with the mirror yeah. test. But if you're a scout looking yeah. at a player for the first time on the sidelines, what are what are the little telltale signs to help you try yeah, and yeah, make okay. judgment around performance and potential? Yeah, um, th- these are the for me. It's, there are four uh, criteria for a scout. So I explain at the end. Um, you have the explosiveness, it's very important. Uh, this is a little bit also the story of Rick. So uh, we are looking for uh, players who are yeah, fast, but when you see a late mature player in a game against an early mature player, it's not so easy for a scout eh, if this player is really fast. Um, so you have also the winning mentality, the winning mindset is first very important. But late mature players, when they are 14, 15 years old, often they have a little bit 
uh, a lack of confidence because they, they think there is something wrong with my, with my body. Um, so uh, sometimes you see they are very talented, uh, talentful when they are 12, 13 years old, but once they, uh, they are 15, 16 years and they have to battle against early mature players, they lose a little bit of uh, confidence, also difficult for scouts. So what we ask our scouts is to focus on insights in the game, decision making, and on the, the body and, the, and the ball control. So how skillful is a player? So and a late mature player who is still on elite level in Belgium, yeah, I think he is there. It's a little bit like survival, survival of the fittest. He is there because um, his decision making and his body and ball control is, uh, is fantastic. So um, they have to focus on this, but um, it's a very difficult job for a scout to um, yeah, do good talent identification in a game when late mature and early mature players are mixed. And this is the reason why we organize a little bit our talent uh, days a little bit on another way. So we invite all these players. We ask the, the degree, the level of maturity, uh, of maturation to, to the clubs. And then we are playing games uh, only with the late matures together, uh, with the average mature and with the early mature players together in one game. So then there is no difference on uh, maturation. And then it's easier for a scout uh, really to, to do good uh, talent identification. And when we organize this kind of talent days, we finish with uh, the game of the late mature players. And the quality of this game is uh, much higher than the quality of the game of the early mature players. So it's uh, yeah, an unbelievable difference. But to make a, a good talent identification when it's mixed is very difficult for me. Yeah. Now we've sort of looked there a lot on, on how we sort of work around the early and late maturers. But I don't know, Rick, are there, are there other similar sort of methods of help around? I mean, I suppose it crosses over as well with the maturity rates, but with uh, with the relative age when we're then looking at Q1 versus Q4. I mean, particularly if you have a Q1 early maturer versus a Q4 late maturer. I mean, the chronological age is maybe a few months, but it can be three, four years in terms of biological age. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's why we're using the biological age and also what, uh, what Bob tells. We do training sessions two times a week in the biological age groups. So to give those guys, uh, I think it's really important to give the guys uh, a feeling of success. So if you have to compete every week, every day to uh, uh, early mature as a late mature kid. Uh, yeah, you will fail most of the time. So it's really important to also give those guys the feeling of success. That's why we shift them uh, down to a, a younger age group to, to be successful and to see if they're still successful, like Andreas told with the, with the rolling dates. I think it's, it's interesting if, uh, if this guy is now in his normal age group, is he now uh, better than the rest, or is he still uh, is, he, is he not uh, not good enough? Uh, so it doesn't mean uh, that a late mature um, also will be uh, a professional football player. Uh, it depends on uh, on a lot of things, and you have to guide them in a really really good way. So um, so yeah, we also uh, shift them down, shift them up. If you're early mature, you have to compete with it with older guys uh, we put them in the in their age group in their biological age group and see how they uh, how they perform over there are they still uh, the best performance or are they are they average um, so yeah we're working we're not actually working with the q1 and, and q4 we're, we're just working with bio age mm -hmm. and that's uh, 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 that's that's how we talk within the club uh, so every trainer knows the biological age of, the, of his, his group, knows which guy is the oldest, which guy is the youngest, and then make a decision about the, the performance and potential. Is that um, similar with uh, your methods at, at Stuttgart, Andreas? That you know you will just look at players in terms of their biological age, and, and hopefully that then will sort of lessen the impact of a calendar Q1, Q4 relative age bias? I have to say, um, Ricky, you are far ahead. Um, 
if you started 10 or 12 years ago. So there, I think every, everything is set by rig. And that's, that's a very interesting way. And that's a good way um, just to have those arguments. If they say, oh, this guy is fast, this guy is maybe too slow, but you just put it in perspective and say, oh, wait a minute. Yes, if we just look at, uh, at that actual performance, yes, this guy is faster than this one. But if you compare this or set this in the perspective you, to the bio age, you can see it might be, but watch out, give him another three years, then this guy will be much faster than this one. So keep him, stick with him, trust him, give him playing time, give him coaching, um, coaching load, help him grow, help him shine. And, and, and it changes a lot, as Bob mentioned, like it's a, it's, it's a shift of, thinking of the mindset of the coaches. Yeah, I think I think that's one of the, the most important things uh, in my role to talk every day to coaches about potential and not of, about performance. So which guy has got the most potential? Okay, let this guy play. Uh, let let this guy make uh, uh, yeah, uh, guide him to his uh, to his career and to the year and uh, yeah, let him shine. That's a nice uh, uh, how do you say it, Andreas? Let him shine. Because that's uh, most of the time what, what doesn't happen. But Andreas, you had a, a really nice model of how you're looking to implement um, your own sort of methods around identifying potential. Um, yeah, I just wondered, yeah, if you go in to a little bit more detail on that um sort of yeah you're sort of looking not just on these simple physical measures but also looking at players history and understanding you know what's come before which maybe give you a picture of why they're at the level they're at now and how much development you could possibly put into them as a as a, an elite development uh youth youth club what's the question <laughs> So yeah, sort of yeah. Looking deeper, you could just not so much a question as uh, could you share a little bit more detail on, on on the model that you you uh, you yeah, described, yeah, okay. as particularly when you're looking at, at sort of you shared with you was looking at the history of yeah. players in terms of their training, the clubs they may have been at beforehand, which allows you to try and give you an idea of what is the amount of potential in this player. Yeah. Um... It's always about if you have two maybe similar players and you you don't know which player to choose because you have a spot open in the squad, and th then you go for for these um, indicators I just mentioned earlier, and as as well in these younger ages, if there is a kid who is forty kilometers away and there's a kid ten kilometers away. Uh, the amount of training you can give the kid with 10 kilometers away is much higher than the amount of kit you can give uh, who's 40 kilometers away and is, is driving an hour uh, to get to the training and an hour back and, and uh, who, who will no uh, child have who will not have any childhood because he's he's in the car all the time so and, and then you're going into that and what happens if you ask those questions and if you go go behind, uh, there's only a player and that's a number and he's fast and he's a good striker and whatever and bring him in. Um, you dive in deeper, the, sc the scouts is dive, going to dive in deeper, building a connection by asking this question. Uh, the coaches are asking questions about this, the history um, and, and you get so much information and the, the information that just you you, uh, you increase the facts you know about the player but what actually happens is you increase um, the relationship to the player and you build trust with the family because they know you're interesting so you have um, the facts on the one hand side but the relation um, and, and building a trust is, is, is much higher worth because then you start um, working with and training with the, with the kids and yeah, so, so that's just a little insight I can give you. And Bob, is that kind of hits the nail on the head with what the future product 
pro project is. Like you say, you're building that trust, you're building that relationship. Whereas prior to 2008, there was, there was a group of players who were not getting anywhere near to playing for the Belgium youth team. And, and so that, that motivation wasn't there for them. Yeah, so I think it's, it's uh, very important also um, to give confidence to the future players. Eh? So when we organize um, an activity with uh, this late mature players, you, you see that the kids, they are very happy to come. Why? Because in their club, they are often on, on the bench. They, when they are 15, 16, 17 years old, they, they think that they are not good enough, that they are not talented enough. Uh, their body is not changing. They think they will never have muscles even. So we, we can a little bit um, yeah, do like a, a mental coach and give the player a lot of confidence. And when they are together with um, yeah, also late mature players, and then they can play a little bit like they want to play, um, you see that they are growing uh, during the, the activity. And when you start this process under 15 and then you still continue like we try to do now until under 19. They are coming together, the late mature players. And then, okay, when they are ready uh, physically, they can also uh, make the step to the uh, to the other team and even play a European Championship uh, under 19, under 21. We are very satisfied. And we feel that um, the players, they appreciate this approach uh, a lot, sometimes even more than, than the normal players. Yeah, so uh, we we have we get more back from them than sometimes the other players. I think uh, 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 confidence is one of the most important things, uh, Bob. Yeah, I think for also. those guys because that's yeah. that's also uh, uh, that that makes them happy, it makes them like the the soccer and wanted to play and wanted to train and. Uh, and that's uh, yeah. If you have to compete with uh, with with early matures every day, yeah, you're losing the confidence, and losing the joy in, in in playing soccer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a question here from Simon Murphy. Um, I'll sort of aim it at, at you first, then Rick. Um, to as he mentions, there's a lot of assessment focuses on player physiology. But uh, what part or how much weight is placed on the psychology of players when looking at maturation and, and the relative age effect? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. It's, uh, it's, it's easier to measure something like uh, physiology than psychology. But it's, uh, I, th I think it's a big deal in, uh, in, in late matures. Uh, what I see in, uh, in the late matures we have in the first team is that they... Uh, they have a lot of setbacks in their career, but that makes them in the end stronger. So the guy, uh, Kelvin Stanks, who is now in the first team, he was he has to do an extra year in under 16. Uh, and all his, his teammates went to the under 17, but he was a uh, really late mature. So we placed him another year in the under 16 to give him success. So we told him this story about, okay, uh, Galvin, you're gonna stay one extra year and down to 16. And for him, it was a, a major setback because all his teammates went to the next next team and he was the only one who has to, to play another year and down to 16. And uh, so, but in the end, if you ask him now, he's, he's, he's telling you, okay, that was the moment, uh, what was really important for my career because then I was making minutes, I was getting confidence. Uh, I was. I was liking football again, so I think the psychology is 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 really important. And and in my opinion, you have to uh, also talk to to those players about okay, you're a late mature. That means this, 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 and this. Uh, um, uh, but keep on going, keep on training. In the end, uh, you will be uh, uh, you will you will be even faster than maybe your peers. But but now it's it's yeah. It's not so make the players aware of, of, of that they are late mature and uh, use this to get a nice conversation and uh, and and keep them motivated. And Andres, I mean, on that is uh, so we look at sort of very much physical testing and understanding biological age, but you're looking also at a player's uh, mental maturity. 
Yeah, great question by Simon Murphy. Thank you, Simon, for throwing this question in. And um, yeah, we, we had the chronological age and we discussed a lot of the biological age, but there might be something like a social age. And there's something like the IQ of the kid. And there, there, there might be a, or there is a, a psychological age um, or maybe quality. So I think as Rick said, it's hard to see what you're looking at is is he likely a winning type or is he performing in both directions or is he running with the ball is he running off the ball is he attacking and defending and and we pretend to know something about the psychologically uh, th side and um, so what we actually do is even with the youngest in our in our club we have um, a psychologically training so the same as they start like training on shooting or passing, they actually train at confidence about emotions. Which emotions do you have? How can you handle your emotions? And do you, do you at least recognize that you have emotions? <laughs> and so, so if Rick said we trust in the development, we do trust uh, that psychological skills can develop as well and not only um, like get thrown if you keep him in an under 16 for two years and then that's kind of obstacle for this guy and then he has to overcome the obstacle and that's one way but um, I believe in that we can uh, focus on coaching and training these even with the youngest because they have fun it's about themselves it's about their emotions so what's better for a kid to say oh I'm nervous, yes. Uh, my knees are shaking. That's how it feels when I'm nervous. And what can I do? Okay, I try this next time. And if he feels, if I try this, when I recognize that I'm nervous and it helps, that's a, a huge um, benefit and an increase for their self-awareness and their uh, self-confidence. So and that's, that's what Rick and Bob were talking about. So not really looking at scouting, um, but then as soon as they're in, uh, they got a lot of uh, psychological training and methods. Yeah, we got the same, uh, Andreas. So we got a, uh, a colleague of mine is doing the lifestyle program inside the club, but it's not only lifestyle, it's also about mental training, uh, uh, focus, uh, how can you use uh, uh, before a game, if you're nervous, uh, how you cope with it. Uh, how you cope with the disappointments and stuff like that. So there's a whole schedule from the under 11 to the, the under 21s about dealing with these kinds of, of, of problems you're gonna face. Then Bob, uh, there's a question here then from Stefan Weiss. It's, um, it's probably a bit more specific, but covers a sort of similar sort of area. Um, but um, we, we spoke a lot about the, the late, late matures and how good they were with the skills. We showed us on your, on your video um, and how strong their decision-making is. But how do you evaluate that decision-making skill? So when you're having your trial Thinking. phase, is yeah, it just yeah. by eye or are you able to put in, you know, sort of test small-sided games where you're looking for specific reactions it's and outcomes? Yeah, for me, it's a little bit the eye of what we call the master, master's eye. Um, but we, we need also to focus, for me, on uh, decision-making on the ball. So when a player has the ball, he must make, for me, three decisions. Will I give a pass? Will I shoot? Or will I dribble? So, um, and, and this is what we, we need to focus. I think positional play how you defend is something that you can learn. But they are very quick um, yeah, decisions because they, they need to decide very fast because in, uh, in a normal game against early mature players, they, um, yeah, they do not have a lot of time. So they are looking for the space in between uh, um, the lines and then they, um, they are watching um, over their shoulder and, and they see faster than normal players uh, the solutions, yeah. So I think it's it's very difficult to measure this 
in specific test uh, decision making. I think you need to uh, develop, invest in your scouts and to give some examples of players at the highest level, like we had also Iniesta, Xavi, show how fast they, they, they find a solution. And, uh, but this is something typically for me for late monthly players because they, they need to, uh, to do this. Physically, they can never win the duel. So, and this is maybe an advantage also to play against early mature players. So it's good for the confidence to, to play with also with and against late mature players. But I'm also for dif differential learning. So to, to offer different situations and even a game against an early mature player. And this is why we also play like against Luxembourg, early players, a bit, a bit less skillful. So they need to find uh, faster solutions. So um, it's an interesting uh, discussion. If we, we can find some, some tests uh, about decision making, I don't know, Andreas, Rick, do you believe in this? I believe in it, uh, Bob, but we don't have the test yet to, uh, about the decision making. It's difficult because football is, uh, you can make so much, so many decisions. Yeah. What is the good one? And yeah, that's that's the the hard thing to to see. Yeah, yeah. very complex football. Yeah. Uh, Andreas, you sort of mentioned in your presentation when you're using the um, three v twos and two v ones. Um, what is the what would you say the advantages of doing that? What is the feedback you're getting from that that is allowing you to make sort of better decisions, more informed decisions on on players, and particularly the early versus late maturer argument yeah yeah the benefits are if you if you have or if you let them play an equal number game maybe a 3v3 5v5 7v7 9v9 whatever there will be always the stronger one as we saw in the video of bob where he lost that one we won at the end and that, that will win that one we won that will uh, score the goal and if you do the two we ones three we twos you just see is the head up high during dribbling is he checking the options does he dribble diagonal to keep to keep both sides open the acceleration and going to dribbling or the uh, the feint the passing feint and going or the pass double pass whatever and then you see most of the time, the late mature, they are smarter because they have to be. <laughs> and the others, they don't have to be smarter. They, they can just pass. So therefore, I think that's a huge benefit for everything. And coming back to Stevens, great question. Um, the data is going up high and you don't know which decision is better. You think passing that guy one we won or two we won and going to the goal it's the shortest way is better but they could be by passing back acceleration switching sides could be also end up in a chance so there is no set of data who says who really says this is the better decision than this one um, but i think subjective wise there will be a what we think nowadays that would be a better decision than this. And by the 2v1s and 3v2s, it's not standard sized, but if you give a kid 10 attacking situation with the 2v1s, and um, you could, I'm pretty sure you could count how many times that um, the, the two guys pass the defender. And even if you flip uh, the tasks, there's only this, there's every time this one kid who passes the defender more often in a 2v1 or in a 3v2 than the other ones. And for nowadays, I think this could be enough to say something about, uh, it is more likely that this kid is a better decision making because they are passing the defender with him in the attack and they might be scoring as well. So therefore I, I like this much better than doing a 5v5 and then just see the stronger guys shine. And Rick, um, it was a bit like with uh, with the uh, with the presentation you showed, and and see the the advantage of over time and, and having your a real strong focus on the data and storing that data and having this marking system that it 
there's always a danger if you're going okay we have to we have to now look after the uh the late the late mature is that that bias goes too far in in one direction it seems that with your system where it's all laid out you kind of know where everyone is relative and in, in a very efficient sort of way as well no. yes so it's not a so we also have uh, early matures who score really good on a physical level and also compared with the biological age so uh so that's that's how we use our system and i think that's the the, the beneficial of uh uh, saying something about the player potential because also an early mature uh, can make it to the first teams. Uh, it's not uh, 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 sure that, that the late matures always make it, but we know that late matures have to compete uh, with the early matures and make faster decisions and stuff like that, like Bob, Bob told uh, and Andreas. Uh, and that's why in the end, uh, they become better soccer players uh, compared with early matures. But uh, yeah, by using our system, uh, yeah, we can have a fair judgment about uh, about a player comparing uh, his biological uh, com comparing with his biological peers. So that's uh, yeah, I think I think it's working in a really good good way. And you you mentioned your your captain who is very low scores. Yeah. Um, on his jumps, was that? Was that, was that yeah, what's this counter movement jump? But you see it in always in always testing. Uh, yeah, this this guy was training. Uh, yeah, he was training his ass off every day. He was doing extra. Uh, he was always uh, in the gym as as, as first, and uh, and as, uh, he was leaving uh, the latest. Uh, and he, his development slowly increases. So in the beginning, he scores like ones, and then he was scoring twos. Uh, and then it was it was going up and eventually in under 18 or under 21 is it was going uh, to sevens and now he's, he's jumping the highest of the whole group which is uh, incredible we haven't seen it before that someone goes from he's coming in at, at under 11 scoring at the lowest of, of all, all uh, his peers and now in the end he's scoring the highest so that's that's something for us to see that the program, the training program, uh, if you follow it correctly and do everything, yeah, we ask you uh, to do, uh, you can achieve uh, uh, great things. And it will help you in the end with your soccer performance. So, I mean, it's, it's like it's hard at this young age that every model that you have would predict if he's normally follows this path, but if you know you have is it just case you have a belief in put that belief in him a belief in your methods that all right we could get him to improve maybe not to the level that he has or yeah. was it something with his maturity levels that he was always going to be at the age of 17 18 when he was fully physically mature that he was going to be able to to reach these levels yeah we didn't expect him to reach these levels uh, but uh, if we get players on young age who score good scores, you always see a drop uh, around uh, uh, the growth spurt. So there's a really drop in performance. Uh, the footwork goes uh, goes down. Uh, so the, the trainers uh, are saying, yeah, this, this player cannot play soccer anymore. He, do, he, he cannot move. And then we're looking back at the testing and say, yeah, but at under 11, under 12, he had really good scores. So this will come in under 17, under 18 back. Uh, so that's also how we're using uh, those development of the of the testing. So around the growth spur, there, there can be a drop in performance. And uh, and it's really important to look at the historical data of, of always test and the performance on a younger age uh, to say something about uh, about what, what he's going to achieve. So if he scores nine in under 12, I believe he also scores nine in under 18. Okay. Ah, Andres, there's a, a smile on your face uh, around that. Um, first, I'll ask you, yeah, what, uh, uh, with Rick's description there is, is, uh, yeah, is, is touching you in, in such a way? Yeah, I, I just like the, um, the quality of work. 
uh, you're doing it ASAP. Thanks, um, I just saw, I just saw the dates uh, lately. How many kids you developed into your first team, and not only they are from your academy. I think most of them, or, or almost every kid, is is with you since the on the on the 12th or on the 11th. Yeah. So that's quite an amazing job, and so therefore that therefore that was the smile. He's he's just um um how do you say giving me that picture back I had from Master Dagma before. So I, I like to to come over and, and see what are you doing guys. Yeah sure. You can visit always. Yeah now in the corona period it's a little bit difficult yeah. but uh, not always but yeah. almost always when this is over <laughs> you're welcome. Thanks. Um, with that specific example we were talking about there, Andreas, the, the skipper of AZ, and again, using the sort of development pathway of it with the bio banding, dropping players up and down age groups. Um, are these tactics that, you, that you're using at, at Stuttgart? Um, not, not, not exactly yet, uh, but, but we are going to, we're up to. And uh, yeah, what, what 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 puts a smile on my face was actually that that if a player was good by the age of 11 and 12, and then he his performance drops by the age of 13, 14, 15, and um, that there is a belief that this is is normal. And if this kid was good and had a good score, they he he will come again and he he will rise again. So, and that's something that give you gives you something to to argue if someone said, oh, that, that was a bad year of this kid, we might change it. And there's another one from a local club nearby. Uh, we'd rather go with him instead of saying, no, 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 guys, that's what we believe in. And that's what he showed. And he will show this again. So just give him another year or another two years that will come by if he um, if he would grow and he was training like he's doing. So that's just, um, amazing for that for that little kid and in developing talent so and on the lines with a with the bio banding as a as a development technique around player maturation I mean, what are what are your thoughts on that what direction do you see uh, do yourself see yourselves at stop going in with that yeah that, that's a direction that that rick is um rick just mentioned so you uh, with it, with this additional perspective, you, you just you going away from subjective meanings. You say this guy will make it, this guy won't make it, and if you ask why, you you think because I think he make it or he won't. So so you just putting you, you are adding layer and layer and layer, as you mentioned. You can't be sure. You can't be sure. And um, doesn't matter how, how much you know, you, you'll never know. But it'll make us safe that we think we know. And therefore, I'd rather go with Ricks and Bobs say, um, if we stick with those kids and if we trust them and if we see something in them and the, it is black and white, we have that's a biological age. And normally, this guy goes like this. And for sure, there could be individual cases that goes like this. But um, with the captain, there, there could be case it goes like this, but um, with all this knowledge added, um, I think we are about to be more fair to the kids, more fair. So if they're performing good once during a period of time, and then which is uh, giving the time to, to develop. I think that's something good from this discussion we we had with you guys. Um, stick with it and bio H bio bending is is very cool to know to add layers to our knowledge and to the perspective to talent development. I think uh, Andreas hit on uh, a point there, Bob, which I think is a strong ethos that came through your presentation that we're being fair and we're giving an equal opportunity to. Yeah. To all, all here, and uh, well, yeah, if you could sort of share a little bit more on that, on how that works in practice yeah. with with your with with what you're doing with the Belgium FA. Yeah, I think this is a starting point. It's about giving equal chances 
So Rick mentioned it also. Um, we still need to work also with the early mature players. Yeah. So um, yeah, for me, every child is unique, and we need to work with every child. E equal equal chances is uh, yeah very important. So I'm very happy uh, when I hear Rick saying that until yeah 16 years for me maybe even later under 18 give the same playing time yeah i i do also the same in in the national team national u teams um even with the other team when you are playing a friendly tournament uh, every player at the end plays equal playing time because you you can never learn when you are on the bench the, the same as when you are on, on the pitch so for me, this approach is, is a first step to convince uh, coaches. Uh, but what's the problem? The coach, he thinks about his own career and he wants to be a champion, yeah? even the youth coach. And then he wants to put it on his CV. And this is not good. Youth, youth development is about individual development. It's not about uh, being champion. It's about uh, yeah, being satisfied when you see your players are making progression. And for me, when you are a youth, coach you have 18 players at the end of the season try to develop the 18 players in the same way and when at the end of the season every player made 20 percent of progression i think then you did a fantastic job as a as a youth coach and it's not about the first in the ranking or the, the second in the ranking and this is um yeah there's also a changing mentality i think still in belgium of a lot of youth, youth coaches is a, is a very big challenge that we have. I mean, in terms of that commitment that club at club level that you can show to players, I mean, at the moment, it seems that decisions are made on players every two seasons. Is that fair, Rick? Or do you think there's maybe from a younger age that we can say, right, you're going to be here until you're from 11 to 15? Or maybe there's a longer time spread that, okay, we'll commit to you for this long, no matter what. Yeah, I think I think that's that's how it should be. So we're bringing in players in under 11, under 12, and if you're uh, bring if you're in AZ at that age, you got a big chance of getting to the first team. When you're going to AZ at under 16, under 17, I haven't seen a guy who's made it to the first team. I think one goalkeeper has made it to the first team. But from under 13 and and down, uh, a lot of players has made it to the first team. So yeah, that commitment, in my opinion, is really important. So if a player is brought in under 11, under 12, let them stay until the under 18s, and then we can have a judgment about is he going to make it or is he not going to make it. But to leave a player at under 15, under 16, is not fair, because yeah, the the. Uh, the potential is not there yet. So uh, yeah, what you say, uh, Steve, will be really, really nice to say to players, okay, you're here from under 12 to under 18, no matter what. And uh, we're gonna help you uh, to develop the best, uh, in the best way. But it's not how it goes right now. But in my opinion, that should be the best. Uh, yes, Andreas, I don't know if you wanna pick up on, on that, what your, what your thoughts are about that. No, I think uh, almost everything is said. Um, it's great. I don't have something to add right now. Um, and sort of add then, uh, then if we then bring in the model that, that Bob has with the national team where you can run two teams together. Um, obviously, there's a, a lot around that in terms of economics and logistics. Um, is that something that could re realistically happen in practice? Is the is the the size for a club like Stuttgart to run two concurrent teams of early and late maturers? I think we see this uh, a lot of times happen in Portugal, even Spain. I don't know exactly if Italian teams do this as well. They, they have more players coming into uh, the club having more teams, a A team, a B team, a C team, to have uh, more talented, uh, talents in the bro program 
to make it as older they, they, they grow to be sure that what we had and put in more training to more talents, more good training to more talents. And then later you can see who's, who's doing best for, for whom was this the best program and who de developed the most. And we, we are not able to do this yet. Even we had thoughts about it and discussions about it. Yeah. yeah, but you also have to think about it. Then you put all the late matures in a group of late matures and all early matures in a group of early matures. But then the whole effect of the late matures uh, competing with the early matures is gone. So I think it's good that they're in the same team, but you have to be aware of it and make decisions of it and maybe shift them back once a week, twice a week. But uh, it, it's, yeah, it will be strange if, if they train the whole year with only late matures because then the effect of, okay, I have to be quick, uh, uh, I have to uh, uh, pass faster than, uh, uh, than when I'm, I'm, I'm with my own biological age peers. So it's uh, for the national teams, I think it's brilliant to do it. So uh, to follow them, but to do it every day on club level, I'm not sure if it, if it, will, uh, it will be effective. I sort of have a last question then with, with Bob. And I just wonder with the, 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 with the process you've introduced at the international level, what, is, what has been the impact of that on, on, on the clubs in Belgium? Have you seen that it has had an impact on an increase in sort of late maturers coming through the system? The, the sort of Q4 players are, you know, that differential in terms of Q4 players being in the system, being given opportunities, there's now more Q4 players in, in academies across Belgium. Yeah, we see an, uh, an impact. So, yeah, also our biggest clubs, um, they are really interesting in late mature players. Um, so what was for us also very important when we started in 2008, also to organize a course for talent uh, identific uh, identification. So talent scouts, they are following the courses and it gives us as, as a federal football association, the opportunity, uh, how to explain a little bit what is talent identification, what is the impact of relative age effect of uh, maturation. So every year still today, uh, I think there are more than 500 uh, people following this kind of courses. Also uh, on, on the lowest level, also on the grassroots level, because there it starts. Eh? So um, for us, what we try to explain is focus on the, the high potentials on the future, but also the way you are coaching. The way you are coaching must be focusing on individual development and not on winning the games. So we are, at, for instance, at the grassroots level. So um, we have a system with um, quarters. So the substitutes, they must enter after each quarter. So when you are on the bench the first quarter, you must play the second quarter. When you are on the bench on the third quarter, you must play the fourth quarter. So there, this is a regulation. There is an obligation so that every child is playing at least 50% of the time. So for me, as a federation, it's important to have a future project because we need also yeah, to participate at European Championships under 17, under 19, but uh, for the club, and I completely agree with Rick, for me, there is no need to have a second team. There is a need to have people like Rick and also Andreas in the club to have the, the right mentality, the right mindset, to focus on individual development, to give all the players equal playing time um, and to work with them for five, six, seven years. This is, the, this is development. So. Uh, Fantastic what I hear here today from Rick and from Andreas. Very good example also for our Belgian club, but also in Belgium, we have good uh, examples. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Bob. I think that's a, a great place to, to wrap it up um, with that simple message of just give the kids the opportunity to shine. <laughs> that's it. Brilliant told by Andreas. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, guys. It's great having you. Perfect summary.